this constitutional amendment and right to property series today i will be speaking about the landmark judgment in the matter of rc cooper versus union of india also known as the bank nationalization case the 11 judge bench of the supreme court delivered this landmark judgment in the year 1970 the brief background of this case which is relevant for understanding is that in the 50s and 60s the state wanted to control important industries in the country as that was seen as the means to achieve the objective of greatest good for the greatest number of people the state believed in socialism and wanted to control the private enterprise several states had nationalized transport undertakings the insurance sector was also nationalized the electricity was made a state monopoly the 60s saw several refineries and oil companies being taken over by the state government in 1955 the imperial bank of india was taken over and converted into the state bank of india the reserve bank of india through its social control had reduced commercial banking from 500 to 89 in the year 1969 the government wanted to nationalize 14 banks which had deposits worth exceeding rupees 50 crores the old guard in the then government was objecting to the nationalization as it thought that the money which was to be paid to these banks in order to compensate them could be utilized in other social purposes morarji desai who was the deputy prime minister at that time was objecting to the nationalization of banks on 17th july 1969 he was dropped as the finance minister and on 18th july 1969 he resigned from the post of deputy prime minister which was accepted and on 19th july 1969 by way of an ordinance the vice president acting as the president promulgated the banking companies acquisition and transfer of undertaking ordinance of 1969 so the 14 banks which were nationalized by way of this ordinance were the bank of baroda the central bank of india dena bank indian bank united bank united commercial bank bank of india bank of maharashtra canara bank indian overseas bank united bank of india allahabad bank punjab national bank and syndicate bank at one stroke 75% of the commercial banking sector in india was nationalized the entire paid up capital all assets and liabilities all rights under the contract would vest under the central government and these banks would be bereft of all their assets and liabilities all the directors of these 14 banks would have to vacate their offices so the only right which these 14 banks was to receive the compensation which was to be determined by an agreement or if in failure of an agreement by a tribunal which was to be constituted under the ordinance of 1969 the name banks thereafter had no assets no business no managerial administrative staff and was incompetent to use the word bank in its name on 21st july 1969 a petition was filed before the supreme court under article 32 of the constitution challenging the validity of this ordinance by one rustam kawas ji cooper was the shareholder of some of the banks and also a director of one of the bank he alleged that this ordinance violated his fundamental rights and therefore had to be declared to be void and unconstitutional the most shocking part of this ordinance was that the compensation that was to be paid to these banks was to be paid in government securities which would be paid after a period of 10 years from the acquisition the main arguments of the petitioners were that there were no existing circumstances which required the president to pass this ordinance under exercise of article 123 as article 123 provided the power of the president to promulgate an ordinance only when the parliament was not in session and if certain exigencies required or the circumstances required him to act in immediate manner the parliament was going to come in session on 21st july that is two days after the passing of this ordinance 
there was no such exigency or no such circumstances existed that the president would have to exercise his power under article 123 to promulgate an ordinance of this nature when the parliament was going to come in session and this act could have been debated in the parliament and thereafter enacted by undertaking the process required under the constitution the petitioner further challenged the act of the parliament as encroaching upon list 2 of schedule 7 the act was outside the legislative competence of the parliament the petitioners further argued that the act violated their fundamental rights as it violated article 14 article 191f and article 312 of the constitution the main contentions and issues which the supreme court was called upon to decide in this matter were whether a shareholder could file a petition for violation of his fundamental rights when the company was taken over whether the ordinance was validly promulgated whether the banking company's acquisition and transfer of undertaking act 1969 was within the legislative competence of parliament whether the said act was violative of article 191f and article 312 of the constitution whether the quantum or method of payment of compensation was valid the state objected to the maintainability of the petition at the hands of rc cooper who was a shareholder as the banks themselves had not challenged the validity of the ordinance before the supreme court and the state argued that rc cooper did not have the locus to challenge the validity of the act the petitioner argued that he had lost his right to receive the dividend and that his investments and the value of his investments had substantially eroded the supreme court with regards to this preliminary issue held that the jurisdiction of the court to grant relief cannot be denied when by state action the rights of the individual shareholder are impaired even if that action impairs the right of the company as well the test in determining whether the shareholder's right is impaired is if the state action impairs the right of the shareholders as well as of the company the court will not concentrating merely upon the technical operation of the action deny itself jurisdiction to grant relief so supreme court held that the matter was maintainable at the instance of rc cooper as his right was also violated by passing of this ordinance before the petitions could be heard finally the parliament on 9th august 1969 had enacted the banking companies acquisition and transfer of undertaking act 1969 and since the act had replaced the ordinance the supreme court did not felt it right to examine the validity of the ordinance since the ordinance had now been replaced by the act and since the supreme court was going to examine the validity of the act it did not decide on the question of the power of the president to promulgate an ordinance under article 123 the petitioner contended that the act violated his fundamental rights and with respect to this argument the supreme court reexamined the judgment of the five judges of the supreme court in the matter of ak gopala and held that the view taken by the five judges in ak gopala that the fundamental rights were to be interpreted as isolated silos and the theory of mutual exclusivity was overruled by this judgment and this aspect of this judgment is one of the most important aspect which it decided in the year 1970 and overruled the view of the supreme court held in ak gopalan in the year 1950 this led to the expansion of the interpretation of fundamental rights in various other judgments which were delivered after bank nationalization case the supreme court held that the enunciation of rights either express or by implication does not follow a uniform pattern but one thread runs through them they seek to protect the rights of the individual or groups of individuals against infringement of those rights within specific limits part 3 of the constitution weaves a pattern of guarantee on the texture of basic human rights with respect to the object and effect test the supreme court held that we have carefully considered the weighty pronouncements of the eminent judges who gave shape to the concept that the extent of protection of important guarantees such as the liberty of person and right to property depends upon the form and object of the state action and not upon its direct operation about the individual's freedom 
but it is not the object of the authority making the law impairing the right of a citizen, nor the form of action taken that determines the protection he can claim. It is the effect of the law and of the action upon the right which attracts the jurisdiction of the court to grant relief. If this be the true view, and we think it is, in determining the impact of state action upon constitutional guarantees which are fundamental, it follows that the extent of protection against impairment of a fundamental right is determined not by the object of the legislature nor by the form of the action, but by its direct operation about the individual rights. So the Supreme Court held that the object of the act alone cannot be a determining factor in order to upheld the validity of the act. The effect of the act has also to be seen, and if the object of the act is in promotion of the national economy and the interest of the nation, it alone cannot satisfy the test of reasonableness, as the effect has also to be seen, and if in effect it violates the fundamental guarantees, then the object alone cannot save the act, and if the act violates the fundamental guarantees, it could be declared to be unconstitutional. So with respect to violation of Article 14, that is the right to equality. So what the Supreme Court held that the 14 named banks are prohibited from carrying on banking business, a disability for which there is no rational explanation. Banks other than the named banks may carry on banking business in India and abroad. New banks may be floated for carrying on banking business, but the named banks are prohibited from carrying on banking business. The petitioner is on a firm ground in contending that when after acquiring the assets, undertaking, organization, goodwill and the names of the named banks, they are prohibited from carrying on banking business. Whereas other banks, Indian as well as foreign, are permitted to carry on banking business, a flagrantly hostile discrimination is practiced. Section 15.2 of the Act, which by the clearest implication prohibits the named bank from carrying on banking business, is therefore liable to be stuck down. With respect to the compensation part, and the guarantee under Article 31, Clause 2. The Supreme Court held that Article 31, Clause 2 provides that the property cannot be acquired without a valid law and that the valid law would provide a public interest for the acquisition of the property and should provide for compensation, which should be just and equitable. The Supreme Court interpreted the word compensation as meaning just and equivalent compensation of the property that is to be expropriated. And therefore, if just and equivalent compensation is not provided, the Act would suffer from the violation of Article 31, Clause 2 of the Constitution. With regards to the argument that the Parliament had the power to provide for the manner and the principle on which the compensation could be fixed, and the said aspect could not be challenged, and the courts could not lay down the Act void on the ground of adequacy of compensation, the Supreme Court held that we are unable to hold that a principle specified by the Parliament for determining compensation of the property to be acquired is conclusive. If that view be accepted, the Parliament will be invested with a charter of arbitrariness and by abuse of legislative process, the constitutional guarantee of the right to compensation may be severely impaired. The principle specified must be appropriate to the determination of compensation for the particular class of property sought to be acquired. If several principles appropriate and one is selected for determination of the value of the property to be acquired, selection of that principle to the exclusion of other principles is not open to challenge, for the selection must be left to the wisdom of the Parliament. With respect to the compensation that was to be paid to these acquired banks, the Supreme Court held that the value determined by excluding important components of the undertaking such as the goodwill and value of the unexpired period of leases will not, in our judgment, be compensation for the undertaking. The Constitution guarantees that the expropriated owner must be given the value of his property, that is what may be regarded reasonably as compensation for loss of the property and that such compensation should not be illusory and not reached by the application of irrelevant principles. In our view, the determination of compensation to be paid for the acquisition of an undertaking as a unit after awarding compensation for some items which go to make up the undertaking and omitting important items amounts to adopting an irrelevant principle in the determination of the value of the undertaking and does not furnish compensation to the expropriated owner. 
we are of the view that by the method adopted for valuation of the undertaking, important items of assets have been excluded and principles, some of which are irrelevant and some not recognized, are adopted. What is determined by the adoption of the method adopted in Schedule 2 does not award to the named banks compensation for loss of their undertaking. The ultimate result substantially impairs the guarantee of compensation and on that account, the Act is liable to be struck down. Accordingly, the Supreme Court ultimately held that the Act was within the legislative competence of the Parliament, but it makes hostile discrimination against the named banks in that it prohibits the named banks from carrying on banking business, whereas other banks, India and foreign, are permitted to carry on banking business and even new banks may be formed which may engage in banking business. It in reality restricts the named banks from carrying on business other than banking as defined in Section 5B of the Banking Regulation Act and that the Act violates the guarantee of compensation under Article 31.2 in that it provides for giving certain amount determined according to principles which are not relevant in the determination of compensation of the undertaking of the named banks and by the method prescribed, the amount so declared cannot be regarded as compensation. So on these grounds, the Supreme Court ultimately declares the entire act to be unconstitutional and declares it void. This was a major judgment of that time, declaring an important national policy of the government to be ultra-virus the constitution. This judgment of that time was criticized. However, this judgment lays down important aspects of constitutional law and is one of the most celebrated judgments of the Supreme Court in its history and ten judges by one voice declared the act to be unconstitutional.